So in this lecture, we'll be talking about the essential computer concepts. You know, what makes a computer a computer? And just immediately even getting into that, you know, your textbook, if you pull it out, you know, what's the definition of computer? Well, here's the definition. An electronic device that accepts information and instructions from a user, it manipulates the information according to the instructions, and displays the information in some way, stores the information for retrieval later. Okay, what does that mean? So if we think about a computer, if we think about our smartphones, our laptops, our tablets, uh, even the smart watches that we have nowadays, you know, what we're looking at is this electronic device, this thing that takes electricity and we interact with it in some way. We type on the keyboard, we touch on our touch pads, you know, we interact with it. And then it takes that, it processes that information, it does something to that. And then it spits something back out for us so that we uh, get some instant feedback that we understand. And then, just in case, you know, if I power it down, it needs to remember that information. So it stores that information for retrieval later. Well, we've got a few different styles of computers. You know, we have the basic desktop. This is what I'm coming to you talking right now on. Uh, these are the old fashions. You know, some of you might actually have a, de a desktop that you're uh, viewing this on right now. Uh, some of you have may have moved on to something like the laptop. Well, the laptop, all it did was it took all of that stuff we had inside our computer and it just made it smaller. And so, even before we get to that, let's think about the desktop computer. So, if you were to open up that desktop computer, you would get something like this. You'd get what's known as a motherboard. And all this motherboard is, is it just kind of holds the circuits in place so that when I turn on electricity, this thing routes it into the correct ways. But I want you to focus in on this guy right here. Now, it looks empty right now. However, that is where we store this guy. This tiny little guy doesn't look like much, uh, even on the screen right now. If we flip it over, this is known as the processor. Now, the processor, this is actually one of the most expensive items on the computer uh, because it is actually considered the brain. It is considered the CPU. It does all of the mathematical calculations. So all those ones and zeros that we talk about when we get into binary conversion, that's what this guy does. That's all it does. And that's actually why it has so many of those pins on the back. If you took a second, you can pause the video if you might. You know, there we are. And count those now. All right, good. So if we look at that, there, there were about 64 pins on the back of that thing because that is known as a 64-bit processor. Now when we get into binary conversion, that'll make a little bit more sense. But like I said, we basically took this giant motherboard and we started to shrink things down because obviously you know, people want to be able to take their computers wherever with them. And the desktop computer, it's a little difficult to do that. That's where we, sorry. That's where we get this idea of the laptop computer. It basically just started to uh, shrink everything down. And I say on the slides, you notice I say it says it's going old fashioned. Well, why do I say that? Because we've now moved into this age of handheld computers. How many of you guys own a tablet? How many of you guys own a touch screen phone? These are becoming very mainstream. And just a fun fact, even if you don't have a touchscreen phone, you still have a smartphone. And the reason why is because that phone has inside of it some program that allows you to store things like your phone book and you know there are little text messaging things that you can do as well. So it is still technically a computer with a phone attached. We have other types. We have things like a standalone computer. The standalone computers are basically your ATMs, your self-checkout lines. So go to Harris Teeter, go to Lowe's. You know, if you're like me, I don't like to interact with people. Uh, I'm a computer guy, uh, but I go through the self-checkout line. Why? It's faster in my opinion. It's easier, but that's a computer. 
in the sense that if we look at the definition again, it accepts user input. Well, let's say for example, here's a Diet Coke I'm drinking right now. It's got a barcode on it. Well, that barcode right there, that's what I scan. That's my input to the computer. It reads that in. It processes that information. It looks into its database. It looks up that UPC code and it finds the uh, number uh, amount to that. And it continues to ring those up for every item I scan until it's ready to be checked out. Until I give it another input that says, let's proceed to the payment process. So standalone computers, they are kind of running our worlds. We also are now moving into this world of wearable technology. And this is very exciting, you know, Google Glasses, or some of you may even have smartwatches like the Samsung or the Pebble, Fitbits, uh, for example. All of them basically are now becoming very, very more prominent in our society. And it's only going to continue to grow. You know, if you take a look at, say, Under Armour, for example, Under Armour is starting to uh, come out with uh, rash guards and compression workout shirts that have just a little kind of Tony Stark Iron Man little thingy that goes right here in your chest. And all it does is it measures out your, your breathing, your, your uh, heart rate, and it's a computer that we wear. It's actually kind of exciting because you can see if that's where we are now, think about in the future. You know, It's not going to be far too long before we start wearing LCD t-shirts. And don't steal that idea because I plan on working on it when it actually becomes uh, possible. So we also have finally something known as our supercomputers. Well, the supercomputer, that's actually sort of the big honcho. Everything runs on supercomputers. Think about if you have an iOS phone, you have an iPhone. You know, you might do Siri. Well, how do you connect to Siri? Truth be told, you're not actually uh, holding a miniature version of Siri in your phone. You're actually connecting to a massive server somewhere out there in the world that does all of that computational process for you. Understanding, you know, how we talk to the computer, doing something known as natural language processing to figure out the words that are coming out of my mouth. You know, how do you understand what I'm talking about? Well, we still have to do that with the computer. It's actually very difficult. The supercomputers allow that for us. Another example is, say for example, uh, Watson. Watson, as you guys can see uh, from the slides, um, technically right now what Watson is doing is helping work cancer research and actually you know helping Africa uh, you know figure out a lot of the logistics of say water placement there's a little video of it so there we are uh, there's a little video of it uh, playing Jeopardy and actually it did really well on Jeopardy so if you're inclined take a look at the link uh, I'll go ahead and give you a second all right, hopefully you took a look at that link and you found it hilarious. So now that we've got all these computers, and you know, it doesn't matter which one you focus in on, ultimately they all run something known as an operating system. And I'm going to even take a step back. Let's look at something like this. This is known as the Arduino Uno. Now the Arduino Uno, a very small, tiny microcomputer. It, it looks like that motherboard that I showed you guys a little earlier. But one of the things that I have here is known as an LED, light emitting diode. Well, if I kind of plug that in right there, let me get it right. Boom. Right now, it's not going to do anything. It kind of is just sitting there. But this has an operating system. It's a very very primitive operating system, but I've designed it so that all it's going to do is when I turn this on, when I give it electricity through this guy, it's going to route through, it's going to go to its processor, this guy right here, which is doing all the thinking, and it's going to tell it to turn on this light. So give me just a second, let me turn that on. And so this is an operating system. Mm -hmm. We take a look. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. All right. I got it waiting for 10 seconds. So in about eight more seconds, it's going to come back on. And that's all I told this thing to do is just to come on every 10 seconds. So it's actually really interesting because this guy right here is all our computers are doing. That's all they do when we work with an operating system. Windows, OS X, iOS, Android, Linux, whatever you're using doesn't actually matter. Uh, what's actually happening is all of those just allow us to have multitasking. This idea of multitasking is what gives me the ability to uh, record a video, have a PowerPoint presentation running over here in the background, and still actually have sort of my browser open right now. So this is where we start to get into a little bit of the components. So I've already shown you a lot of the uh, hardware side of things. Hardware, that's the architecture of the computer. That's literally the circuitry going on to make sure that I can take power and turn it into my screen. But then we get into software. And software is actually where we're going to focus in a lot uh, later on in the semester when we start getting into Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access. Uh, those are all software. And the weird thing about software is it's intangible, meaning I can't actually show you software. I can't, I can't explain software uh, because all software is is a set of instructions. It's literally me telling this thing to turn on its red light uh, every 10 seconds. That was software that I wrote for that purpose. So it is a little bit on that interesting side of things. 